The proteins are our next type of organic molecule and the proteins are amazing. They do so many different things in our bodies and we're gonna be seeing a lot of complexity as we look at proteins. Um, so what I'd like to do is start off with sort of the, the general overall st structure, what, like what are proteins built from, and then we'll get into some more intricacies a little bit later on. Um, so proteins are built from connections of molecules called amino acids. So take amino acids and connect them up together and what you can end up building is a protein. Um, amino acids, there are a lot of different amino acids that exist. We know of 20 different amino acids that exist naturally. And um, what do they all have in common? They kind of all have a similar backbone to them and it's a carbon-based backbone. So um, let me just show some, some pictures here. So they all have these three things that are indicated. I'm gonna try and point to these over here on the pictures. Here's, um, here's a list of, of amino acids. This, these are examples of amino acids. What they all have in common is they all have an amino end. That means this nitrogen containing group, that's the amino end. And then they also have a carboxyl end, that's this thing right here, the COO minus. And then they also have an R group. Um, what this means, this is just a carbon-based group. I'm not sure where the R came from, but um, that's the part that's shaded. So like alanine right here has a, a CH3 is the R group. Isoleucine has a bigger R group. And so all amino acids kind of have those three things, amino group, carboxyl group, and then an R group. So um, I mentioned that there are 20 different amino acids and they get classified according to their chemical properties. So in this box, what we're looking at are the nonpolar amino acids. Okay, all of them are listed out right here. We could also talk about the polar amino acids. So that just means that the R group has some type of polarity to it. We could also look at amino acids that have a positive charge to them. Okay, three examples of that. And amino acids that have a negative charge to them. Two examples of that. So if you count them all up, in total, there are 20 amino acids. And they can be linked together. Um, so again, how would you link them together? What type of reaction is it that allows you to connect building blocks together? Um, that's gonna be a dehydration reaction. Okay, so these guys, these amino acids, can be linked together by a dehydration reaction. And the type of bond that that ends up forming gets a special name. In the context of proteins, it's called a peptide bond. These are just the connections between amino acids. Okay, a couple of other words to know. Um, a polypeptide is kind of a smallish chain of amino acids that have been connected together ranging between 3 and 100. Proteins, proteins tend to be pretty large. So usually um, if you have a like a polypeptide that's more than 100 amino acids long, usually that's getting into the protein range. And our bodies make lots of different types of proteins. We will see many examples as we go through the course. Proteins, the way that they function is completely dependent on their structure. So we need to talk about structure of a protein. All right, so we've just been talking about how you can connect amino acids together in a particular series. It turns out that's the primary structure level. That's the primary level of structure is just like, what order are the amino acids connected in? Okay, um, depending on the order that they're connected in, that's going to influence the next level of structure of a protein. So the next level is called the secondary structure. And this has to do with interactions between adjacent amino acids. So maybe this one is negatively charged, maybe this one's negatively charged, and they're gonna repel each other a little bit, for example. Okay, what that will do is create a spot where there's a bend in the chain. So um, this ends up leading to a couple of possibilities in the secondary structure. We can get things like spirals forming, or we can get what's called a beta pleated sheet. This just means the chain kind of zigzags back and forth. And these types of structures are stabilized by hydrogen bonds. OK, 
Okay, going up in complexity even more, if we look at the three-dimensional structure of a protein, that's called the tertiary structure. And this is made up of all the combinations of um, alpha helices and beta pleated sheets all put together. So tertiary structure is like the three-dimensional shape of the protein as a whole. And as you can see, it can get really complex. So this is due to a lot of different electrical interactions going on and um, it, it's stabilized by hydrogen bonding primarily. There is a fourth level to structure and that's called the quaternary structure. Um, this one doesn't exist in all proteins. This is just in specific ones. For example, hemoglobin in our blood. Um, what goes on here is we actually have multiple proteins that come and assemble together and that's the quaternary structure is these multiple subunits that come together in order to fulfill some some role um, carrying oxygen or or whatever it is so um, anyway four levels of structure i'd like for you to know the difference between them on a related note it's possible for proteins to lose their structure and that's called denaturing a protein denaturation is something that is usually permanent. So if a protein, if we have a protein and if it unfolds um, for some reason, that's something that is almost impossible to undo. It's almost impossible to get it to refold in the correct shape again. And this is what happens um, when you cook certain foods, like when you cook eggs. This is why eggs go from being clear and runny to being white and kind of firm. It's because the proteins get denatured and that's not a reversible thing, right? Just because you cool the egg back down doesn't mean that it goes back to being liquid and runny. Um, so this is usually permanent. And in the context of human biology, this is, can be really serious, right? This is why temperatures can be really dangerous if they go too high and last for too long um, because it can make the proteins in our bodies and even in our brains start to denature. So that's why it's important um, to not let fevers go too high for too long. So temperature can cause denaturation. Also changes in pH can cause denaturation. So those are, we mentioned that earlier, the importance of maintaining a stable pH. This is another reason why, is because we need to protect these proteins. One special class of protein in the human body is the enzymes, uh, are the enzymes. Enzymes are just special proteins that can facilitate reactions. They have a special area um, that facilitates reactions between other things. And um, let me just show you the picture here. Okay, so right here is a schematic of an enzyme or protein. And it's got what's called an active site where other things can bind. So this yellow molecule and this green molecule, they come over and they bind to the enzyme. And then what the enzyme does is it kind of facilitates an interaction between these two in a way that wouldn't normally happen as readily. Um, so it makes some type of a reaction take place and then the enzyme lets go of the end result, that's called the product, and what's just happened, this enzyme facilitated a chemical reaction. So interestingly, the enzyme does not get used up in the process. Um, it can be reused. It can grab onto a couple other molecules now and do the same thing all over again. And this is how a lot of reactions take place in our bodies. Enzymes do a great job of speeding up reactions, making them happen more quickly than they would have otherwise. They're called catalysts. That's what that word means. They speed, speed up chemical reactions. And um, they're reusable, so they're super neat molecules. If we didn't have enzymes, these reactions wouldn't be able to take place quickly enough to sustain life. So enzymes are, are necessary for sustaining life.